Чоловік, який представляє SOIL в Сполучених Штатах Америки, він є відомий за багатьма проектами. Взагалі, бюро, яке він представляє, вважають найсміливішим у Сполучених Штатах. Найбільш відомий завдяки скляному павільйону в Толедо, Огайо. Та... And we can hear you. Hey, hey guys та нового музею сучасного мистецтва у Нью-Йорку. Під бурхливі оплески вишуканої публіки запрошуємо Флоріан Іденбург на цій сцені. Гучніше, гучніше, це ж ранок суботи. Дякую. Хай, я, дякую. Добре. Говорити про вважання, it's very valuable to have a seat here. Uh, I had to get up at three this morning to, uh, to get here. Um, I'm going to talk, um, I'm going to show three projects we recently um, realized. Um, but I'm also going to show sort of the biggest project we recently completed, which is a book that we just finished. And I have a copy here with me. Um, published by uh, Lars Muller, uh, called Order, Edge and Aura. Um, and it's a book we worked on uh, for two years, uh, but basically it is the first book we, we um, made with our office, which we started in 2008 in, um, in the United States, in New York. Um, but I'm Dutch, um, I'm from the Netherlands, uh, and we're talking today about, I think, um, values and what design can do in these values. Um, and obviously the Netherlands uh, is a place in which design has played a big role in shaping uh, society. Um, this idea that through planning and through organization we can make and we can be in control of, of the world uh, that we live in. Uh, my partner uh, is Chinese, Jing Liu, we met in Japan, um, uh, and also in China the idea of um, the construction of society is obviously one that is very uh, strong and very present. But as we started in 2008 uh, to work on our practice, or over these last eight years between 2008 and, and 2016, we see that these systems, the ideas, the structures that we put in place, the, the, the structures that we design in a way to, to keep us stable, are leading to um, instability, reactions, um, they, they trigger tensions, and now we are um, in a time when there's actually a sense of nostalgia, a sense of um, angst maybe, for the societies that we, that we are trying to create. And so our practice, um, which um, yeah, in, in, it was very much um, committed to creating um, architecture that produces culture, so a, a real belief in the ability for architecture to affect basically um, our society. The question in these last eight years was, eight years was how to how to um, um, make an architecture in such condition of instability and unpredictability. And so we, rather than trying to control, so to say, the outcome of some of these, um, of, of, of the ideas, we try to see if in this instability, in this unpredictability, in this uh, uncertainty, a new sort of form, a new aesthetic, a new beauty maybe, um, can be found. And so our practice, oh, this is a video. I'll go one back. Oh. It's an anime, yeah, there we go. So um, we've, been, we've been searching, and actually our practice is one that is very much about experimentation and trying to um, search for sort of uh, uh, yeah, new, new systems. Um, and I'll get to this project uh, in a little bit, but it shows sort of the, 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 the experimentation of flexible structures, of open structures, of instability as a, as a, as a, as a condition. 
the search for form that is not necessarily explicit, but actually can be interpreted in, in multiple ways. Um, a, um, uh, the, the development of, of scripts, we work in, in software as well to experiment with sort of new type of forms and new type of conditions, and we, we test um, with standard products to see what can be done, and sometimes uh, we test with, with unconventional and new uh, ways. Uh, and we embrace this idea of, of failure and, and collapse because we think that only uh, we can move forward if we're open also to embrace uh, things going, going wrong. Uh, an installation we did for the storefront for art and architecture, which is on the cover here, um, within hours um, was embraced by the city and its uh, reality. Um, and I think in that, um, in that condition, is, is, it, it's actually very um, potent and very uh, um, um, inspiring place to, to operate in, to not necessarily believe that what you come up with can be uh, controlled. Uh, the book that we made is not a monograph, it's actually trying in some way to be an agenda for an architecture in, in, in stable times, uh, uh, sort of a, a manifesto um, within this uncertain condition. And it's organized around three um, points of gravity. Uh, it's not necessarily chapters, but we've organized basically the, the projects and the experiments and the work that we have done um, in these three sections, but they, they read very uh, continuously. And the first part talks about order and organization, it speaks about how to create systems that are not necessarily organized around function, not necessarily organized about program, but more about material organizations that create a certain openness, a certain flexibility in use, and open structures. I think there was an earlier conversation already about how to create openness. And we've been experimenting with how to create some material order that do doesn't necessarily fix this program, is not necessarily static, but creates new ways of use and new ways of navigation. Um, what you saw here is a museum proposal where we, where we suggested to make all the rooms basically out of the same system and they could be used either for galleries or for a library or a shop. Um, and then the, the circulation system actually by putting the, 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 the connections between the rooms on the corners, it means that you cannot dictate the routing. Actually you as a visitor, you as a user, you as somebody who moves through this building can actually create its own route because every time that you come to the edge of a room, you are the one who, who chooses how to continue the path. And this would challenge ways of curation, it, it, it creates new ways of storytelling, and it creates sort of new uh, types of relationships. Um, this project, which is also part of this idea of order, is the first project we did, which is the um, project for PS1. It's, an, it's a flexible structure. The structure um, uh, was installed in the courtyard um, of, of MoMA, uh, uh, the, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, and it represents uh, basically this idea of modernity, the white Cartesian grid. Um, but it is a weak structure. It's a structure that is not offering us stability. It's actually a structure that is always on the verge of collapse. It, it's flexible, it's elastic. And actually we, as users, are responsible for its stability and its possible um, uh, um, collapse. Um, and so in these open structures, you see sort of new activities and new relationships being established. This is pictures we found online of new games that started to take place within, this, within these structures. And also play and, ga and games that we hadn't uh, anticipated. This is a, an email attachment from the, from the lawyer of the, the, the MoMA saying that we as designers were fully responsible for all bodily harm and even death that might occur uh, within our installation. Uh, luckily, that didn't happen. Um, order can be, um, can be chaos or, or order can be non-structured. This is the first sketch for a museum um, I will show later that we opened in, uh, in, in California early this year or uh, the plan for a, um, a public space in, in Bahrain uh, in Manama, which is about the coexistence of multiple publics and how to create soft borders between different points of view. Uh, the second section of the book speaks about edge, it speaks about the, 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 the transition of these systems within its site, within its society, within its context. So how do you negotiate this, this system, this organization with its context and how do you deal with the thresholds and the movements between say the exterior, the site, the, 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 the environment 
and, and these uh, organizations. Um, and the project that um, I think in some way highlights our thinking um, well is this um, small installation we did for the Hong Kong Shenzhen Biennale a number of years ago, um, which is called Tri Colonnade. We were asked to make a facade. Uh, the, it was a reenactment of the, the street, uh, an installation done by Paolo Portoghese at the, at the Venice Biennale in 1984. Um, and so in Shenzhen in, I think, 2012, um, Terence Riley uh, asked a number of young architects again to make this street, to make this facade, make a skin, and behind it show uh, your work. Uh, but we, we challenged this idea that architects can only be involved in, in the skin itself and that maybe the market or code or other types of things de define the interiors. And so we were interested in, in seeing how can we create depth in the skin? How can we make the, the space between the public and the private more uh, ambiguous and more deep and where there is sort of an, a space that is neither public nor private but actually sort of the exchange that happens uh, between it. And so we, we played with this idea of the colonnade. A colonnade is obviously a deeper uh, facade, a, a space between interior and exterior. Uh, and we used the, 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 the walls of the booth actually to, to set the, the dimension of this, of this colonnade. Uh, but then when you enter, and that was the image before, it's the, it shows us the, the plan. There's actually a multitude of sort of bracketed spaces. These triangles, they're lined with a marble uh, veneer and the back with mirror. And once you enter, actually, sort of an, uh, an endless space um, uh, occurs. And this idea of depth within the, 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 the zone between uh, public and private is something we, we try to pursue in many places because suddenly there is this uh, necessary um, uh, exchange, this, necess this, this need for um, negotiating between, you know, ownership, between responsibility, between sort of what is in and what is out. Um, they can be very ephemeral. Um, they can also happen between uh, activities themselves. This is a space we did actually for um, a Ukrainian client, I realized. He uh, was born in the U.S., but from a Ukrainian background, he has a, a digital company. Um, where everybody is a freelancer and so they work with project teams um, and how to create sort of a sense of community while you're not necessarily colleagues and also give a sense of privacy. So the screens, which are theater walls here without um, any joints, they, they create a sense of uh, awareness of the other in the space but not necessarily uh, fully exposing uh, them. Uh, currently we're working um, and building uh, a museum in Hong Kong where we use these um, transparent uh, curved uh, columns um, to hint uh, uh, at the, the, the activities taking place um, behind it but not fully um, uh, revealing it. Um, these edges, they can also be more defined, they can frame. This is a community center in Belgium where we use the really closed frame, it is in the countryside, to create a, a protection for this community with a number of, of uh, openings. Um, or sometimes the entire building can become the frame. This is collective uh, housing we did uh, for people who used to be uh, in jail and now have to come back into society where the, where the, the units themselves, they form the, the framing of the, of the community. Um, and then these transitions, they can sometimes just be uh, deeper um, um, they can be projects in themselves. This is an installation we did for the Chicago Biennale last year uh, in which the entire transition from one space to the next actually is the, is the project. And the last <coughs> part, the, the third part, so to say, of the, of the book is maybe the one that is the most difficult um, to, to, to articulate, I think, as, as architects. We, um, are very able to talk about program, we're very able to talk about use, we're very able to talk about um, uh, yeah, uh, function, but it's very hard to talk about uh, aura or the presence of a building and how this material order, because as architects in some way all we do is just order matter. How does this matter appear and what is the, what is the character of this, of this aggregation of, of, of elements? And so we've been searching for maybe um, uh, um, an articulation of, of mass and form that plays between being explicit and implicit. 
So something that in a way can be understood um, in multiple ways and creates a certain um, um, ambiguity of, of form, something that basically allows for multiple uh, interpretation because we believe if something is not singular but can be seen um, um, through multiple points of view, it's easier to organize um, uh, a collective uh, around that. And so, you know, how do you create like a cloud, something that can be seen um, through different lenses without necessarily excluding one or the, or the other? Um, and so I think the three projects that I will show are three projects on three continents. Um, we, are, we are with um, 20 people in our office in Brooklyn. We have 12 languages uh, uh, spoken. And I, I, I really um, enjoy the ability to, to work um, between different cultures and, with, uh, and within different contexts and see sort of how, um, how to operate within these, this attitude and this search uh, and this e experimental um, uh, process and what sort of uh, outcomes those, uh, those create. So the first project was actually our first built uh, um, ground up project in, um, in Seoul, in, uh, in Korea. Um, and here we were asked to make um, a contemporary arts gallery in a historic uh, context. Um, and as a, a space, um, this is, this is um, Seoul, um, the capital of South Korea. It's a very, um, a, a city that was very much affected by um, the Korean War. Uh, most of the city was destroyed uh, in the 50s and 60s and then rebuilt um, in um, yeah, concrete uh, high rises, a very large city, but one area uh, near the old um, uh, imperial palace is, um, was, left, was, was saved. Uh, this is where the, um, the servants uh, of the palace used to live in these um, old uh, Hanok homes, these courtyard homes. Um, and so here you see sort of those one-story brick uh, courtyard homes as a context. And because this is the only area that was saved, <coughs> um, it's the most walkable part of the city and actually a really uh, nice uh, and beautiful part uh, of town. Um, <coughs> the, the gallery that we um, were asked to make a third space for uh, is called Kukche Gallery, and Kukche means international, and this is a, um, uh, a, a gallery, a Korean gallery, that, that connects uh, Korean artists with the rest of the world and also brings um, um, yeah, Western artists into, into uh, Korean, uh, in a Korean context, and they've been uh, growing uh, uh, and being successful at that, and so because of that they started with one small building here that gradually grew into this fine grain of the historic fabric. And then they made a very big, um, very ugly building um, uh, in 2006, which is this very big, um, 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 yeah, uh, uh, sort of monolithic box. Um, and we were asked again for um, a contemporary art space. You, you have to make something for art that doesn't exist yet, right? So typically the question then is how can you make the largest flexible space possible? And the brief here indeed was how to make the biggest sort of single clear, clear box uh, uh, possible. And we started to, to see what that would mean, this, this white cube, this sort of um, sightless, um, totally contextless, neutral white cube that we all know as the contemporary arts gallery and what that biggest box would be. And we even pushed out all circulation to the exterior to emphasize sort of the, 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 the singularity and the clarity of that, of that white art cube. This is the entrance, this is an elevator that takes you uh, down below. There is storage and a theater and some other uh, offices, the mechanical box and a stair that takes you to the roof to look over the, over the palace. Um, but as we went to um, present, we realized that this diagram, this, uh, this crude diagram was too hard, too aggressive, too, um, too rudimentary for this very fine grain and sensitive uh, context that we were operating in. And we thought, what if we can create sort of a permanent uh, mist, a permanent fog, a permanent um, blur around this, this building? Um, and so we 
needed to find something that would be both strong um, but also pliable, something that could um, uh, um, take on this very complex double uh, curvature um, but at the same time not be constructed out of, out of triangles or out of shingles, maybe how somebody like Gary would do it. And we came across this chain link mesh, this medieval mesh, which um, is made from steel, um, but at the same time is super flexible, as we can see um, here. Um, but it only exists on the scale of the, of the body. It's made now for um, belly dancing attire and butcher gloves, um, but not necessarily on the scale of architecture. And so we started to see, hey, if this is the largest scale you can, um, you can um, buy and uh, you can fabricate, um, but what is, the, what is the right scale for, for the building? And we started to test in our office uh, just by cutting rings and trying to understand how this pattern uh, works. And we started to un understand also where does elasticity come from? We used um, a small piece and we saw that in one direction it falls straight in a square and then you turn it and it suddenly starts to ply. And so we saw that there's a pliability in one direction and how much can you stretch it before it starts to bundle up and become unattractive. And then we, we asked uh, an engineer, <coughs> a friend of ours, um, once we had sort of the scale that we thought was right for the building, to start analyzing how the forces uh, worked, first in the individual ring and then in these weaves as a, as a totality. Can these things actually be applied um, uh, as, a, as a building um, skin? And at some point we had the entire um, force field, so to say, uh, modeled uh, digitally and we were able to see where are the points of tension, where can these things, um, where, where does the pressure get too high and it was very important to distribute uh, the forces over the building so we could make some adjustments digitally to see how these forces uh, um, would change. Um, and so at that moment we really understood as a model, as a digital model, um, as, a, as an idea how this thing um, could work. Uh, but then, how to translate this into into um, into reality? So we we also build a model um, in our office um, with with that same um, uh, available um, uh, mesh, uh, and this is actually really used to ultimately uh, define how to how to make this. And by this moment, we thought we know we know so much about this material. How now to realize this in Korea? Are we going to translate everything into Korean a set of specifications and ask somebody to, to make it? And then <coughs> we thought, why don't we make it ourselves? Um, because we were the ones who probably understood the material uh, the best. So together with the engineer, we, we asked our uh, client, can, we, can you um, give us some money up front and we will produce this? Um, and so we went to Alibaba.com and we typed in ring mesh. And this is a while back now, I think Alibaba is well known. At that time it was, uh, this is 2010, I think. Um, we suddenly got a lot of people who wanted to be uh, our friends um, uh, on Skype uh, from this area in Anping in, in China, one region in China. And one of the most aggressive Skypers was somebody by the name Ring um, and we thought that's promising because we were looking for a ring mesh and so we Skyped with her for about a month and after another month um, they, this thing arrived uh, in our studio in Brooklyn uh, and this is a picture on the roof and we thought this is promising, this is actually, um, this is very close to what we had hoped for. Um, <coughs> I don't know if people met their uh, girlfriend or boyfriend online, um, but then sometimes you have to go and visit the, the person in, in reality. And after we, we received this, we thought, let's meet. Um, and so we flew to uh, Beijing and we drove for six hours um, through the countryside to arrive in, in Anping. And there was Anping. Anping was a very, very small town. Um, and we met um, Ring. Um, and we came into this courtyard, which is the size of this stage, and there was Ring's brother, um, who, who was hand welding this together um, by himself. Um, and so here, 
is Jing, my partner, Mike, the engineer, and uh, that's Ring. Um, and by this moment, we, we knew we needed half a million rings um, uh, in this, in this uh, building skin. And so <coughs> it took them a month or something to make this. So we thought this is not going to happen. But Ring then said, well, everybody in this town can weld. And why don't we find a way to do something that we can do collective? Because it's not um, so difficult. And so we experimented. We stayed there. And we figured out a, 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 a different way of producing, where actually multiple people could work collectively on a, a series of these uh, swaths. Um, and so we. We, we had to explain to, to a larger, the larger community what would work and what wouldn't work and what was acceptable because all of this had to be made um, yeah, by, a, by a variety of people. Um, and one person he knew best, so he basically explained to others how this needed to be made. And then at some point there was a real collective effort of about 60 people uh, working together uh, on this. And it was really something that they had not done before. This place is a place where they normally make um, uh, weaves and meshes that are being used in the automotive industry or they make these geo um, textiles that hold rocks from falling down the, the hills and for them this is a completely new type of um, experience to, to, to make this um, a custom uh, product and so we ended up making 14 of these large uh, swaths uh, this is the local car wash that was used for the degreasing and, and cleaning um, and another a shed where we actually checked every single weld because um, they needed to be um, inspected before we shipped them. We made a mock-up in the local school yard and um, that was approved. Um, and so then we could ship uh, these things to um, to Korea to the to this um, concrete diagram that had been uh, built. And you see the historic. Uh, homes uh, around them. Um, we worked with a, a guy who works in fishing with fishing nets. Uh, he helped uh, install it. Uh, and so the, the building, in a way, got, got, got its um, custom dress, so to say, its seamless dress. We ultimately also welded those swaths together in the same uh, technique, so you couldn't see any uh, uh, joint. Uh, and here you see the, the detailing and the way we try to uh, diffuse the forces over the whole uh, building and the relationship between sort of the historic craft and maybe a more uh, contemporary craft of these two uh, roof lines. And what is interesting, the building itself, it doesn't really appear as an, as an object. It's so embedded within the historic fabric that suddenly you come out of an alley and there is, the, is this sort of elephant that you can't really uh, read as a single um, uh, form with these um, uh, yeah, protrusions sort of under the under the skin, uh, and then there's places where you can go through, where you get in between the the box and this outer uh, skin, sort of a, a, a poche if you want, um, where you can go up to the to the roof, or when you enter the building itself, there is this little glimpse and also this blurring of the of the of the site. Uh, and so here you see the relationship between sort of these roof lines and the way it tries to uh, establish a more um, not historical relationship, not a not a mimicking of history, but but in a way a contemporary response to its to its uh, uh, context. And so when it gets dark, the mesh gets stronger, and during the night or during the day, it is more transparent. So there's always this sort of um, Ambiguity, I would say, between where is the edge of the, the building, actually. Uh, and here you see it sitting in its context with the, with the palace behind. Um, a second project that in some way builds on the, um, the say, uh, diffusion of the, of the edge is a uh, a building we recently finished in um, the University of California, Davis, and afterwards we made this model. Um, this is a, a large canopy. It's a museum uh, on a campus. I will get to that in a second. But the idea here was to, to create sort of a big roof as an infrastructure that can be, that activates uh, below. And this is an installation we did afterwards that speaks to this concept. It's a completely uh, analog installation. It's purely through graphics and a perforated sheet of metal, but it gives, gives this very digital, um, uh, has this very digital sensibility, although it's 
fully um, analog. Um, a museum <coughs> in the University of California um, system, the University of California, maybe people know, is the public University of California, so it's, a, it's, a, it's basically a free university and it has 12 um, campuses uh, throughout uh, California. Um, and the, the one in Davis, where we um, did this museum, is the most agricultural um, focused um, uh, campus. It used to be the farm um, of the University of California, Berkeley. Um, it is in the Central Valley. The Central Valley is this area in California that basically sits behind the coast which, in which most of the fruit uh, and vegetables that are uh, eaten in the US are, are being produced. And so it's a very, very flat, horizontal sort of polar landscape. Um, and <coughs> this school is where most people study. Um, and so the focus is really on bioengineering, on, um, on cloning sheep, on inseminating bees, but not necessarily on the arts. Um, it's also a, a, a lot of first-time um, um, university-going families, a lot of children of immigrants that get a chance to go to school here. Um, and many of these people end up working also in um, Sonoma Valley and Napa Valley, which are the places where in the US wine is being produced. And there are a few people there that, that, that thought it would be great to actually introduce the arts a little bit more in the basic life of the students so that they're not just involved in, the, in biotechnical engineering, but also you, you have, the, have exposure to the arts to make them more full um, people. And so they, they first built a performing arts center here um, for, for performance. They, they build a wine and food culture center uh, over here. And this is a competition for um, uh, a museum um, on, that, on that site. Uh, but the museum didn't exist yet. There was no collection. Uh, there was no mission. There was no idea. Um, and so it, the, the building really had to, in some way, set also the, the mission itself. Um, it, was a, it was a competition where we had to work together with a contractor. It was a design-build competition, which meant that we also had to guarantee the price. Um, the state of California was doing not so well at that time. It actually went bankrupt. Uh, and so there, there was a, a set maximum that this building could cost. And there was no, not a dime that we could go over. Anything that we would go over, we'd, we would have to pay uh, ourselves. So it was a big sort of um, risk in that sense. Hello? Yeah. Um, so, how to create a, a, a museum of art that doesn't exist yet for an audience that doesn't normally go and see art? It was really a question from, from scratch. Um, and we thought we'd take the, the, um, the, 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 the condition, the site, but not the site in a way, but more the site in a metaphorical way as a point of departure. This landscape, the landscape um, uh, around here, the landscape that these students um, work in and think about uh, is one of, of, of production. It's not a romantic landscape, it's not a beautiful context, it's a, it's a site um, where, where people get a sense of ownership, where people get a sense of destiny, where, where every season something new can grow. And this idea of, of, of creating a, um, a structure or a, a, yeah, a land, uh, a ground that they could uh, um, um, sort of produce their own narratives, that they could um, 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 yeah, be responsible for the transformation itself was one of the ideas that we really tried to introduce into the the project, basically a fertile uh, ground that changes every season where the, where the user, uh, the student themselves are sort of responsible for what happens there. And then how to create a, a presence, uh, how, how does this, uh, in this flat landscape, how does this uh, structure, how does this uh, um, uh, ground sort of announce itself to the, to the world? It was for the university also important, maybe you saw, it was at the edge of campus, so it's the challenge is how to draw students to go there, but because it was also at the edge of campus, it was also the first thing that people from outside would see. And so, it, so the, the question of its presence and of, of its aura, maybe something that we just spoke about as the third part in this book, was also 
um, important. Um, and we created this very open structure. We thought we make something that just covers the entirety of the site. We didn't look at program necessarily. We just started to make um, a structure, an open structure that could be inhabited, that could be uh, used, that created a variety of different types of spaces, sort of a patchwork of spaces, both inside and outside, both open and closed, both uh, small and big and light and dark. Because if you have to build um, a space for art that, that hasn't been made yet for students who, are, who haven't been born yet, then you know, how, do you, how can you follow a function or how can you follow a program? So this idea to create variety or to create a system that, that generates variety, a variety of spaces in which different things can occur uh, over time was one of the, the, the main uh, ideas driving this uh, design. And ultimately, sort of its initial program found sort of its, its, um, its locations within the building, but it doesn't mean that this has to be used continuously in this way. And we, we basically, and I showed you this earlier uh, hand drawing that we had, um, we, we organized uh, the, the sort of three, um, uh, um, say, core elements that have to do with viewing art, uh, producing art, um, and sort of operations um, in, in sort of these three uh, pavilions covered by this large roof and, and um, uh, in the center, held together by this very transparent open gallery with an area, a, a series of exterior spaces where art making can happen, and then a large open public um, space, a sort of an open infrastructure, very similar to the uh, installation we did for MoMA that the students can use for art, uh, uh, for hanging out, um, for projection, um, and what have you. And so, those three elements and the, and the interstitial spaces uh, in between, they come together under this large um, canopy, this large roof. We wanted to have the, the, um, the environment in a, uh, not, not just from a sort of sustainability standpoint, but much more from a conceptual standpoint also be part of the museum. We wanted the, the students for whom climate is so important, if you, if you are thinking about agriculture, um, obviously, the environment is the key um, uh, thing to think about. And, and in Davis and in California, the sun, the presence of the sun is, is a real visceral thing. It has a very profound effect during the, the, the project design process itself. Uh, California went through this gigantic drought and it really fully affected everything, um, including uh, how immigrants could live uh, within um, within this area because work also dried up and so we wanted to make the the environment really sort of a substantial part of the experience and we th we th we we try to see how can we manipulate the the sunlight in some way that that we can control the shadows and have this variety of spaces also happen um, within the uh, the canopy itself and we started to experiment with different ways to control and manipulate um, shadows. Um, we try to see how can you make very sharp shadows and how can you make very diffuse shadows and again we always experiment both uh, digital and physical. We think you need to do both of these things rather than in one mode only and ultimately we set on um, a, a, a triangular sort of perforated beam, we, 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 this is on the roof in, uh, in our office in Brooklyn, um, that spans between the, the primary steel and so I will show this in more detail later but basically the canopy is built of this primary uh, steel structure and rather than having secondary steel and, and perforated panels which is the the way our contractor wanted to do it we said what if we combine this secondary steel and the and the perforated panels themselves into these beams that are perforated that give a very strong graphic from below and then a very smooth uh, graphic actually from from above because this building and this this skin, if you want, um, is being experienced both from below and also from, from, uh, from the outside. The, the facade, the exterior is actually the roof um, itself. And so we wanted to show these lines, and this is only the public plaza part, um, in the, in the, um, uh, um, yeah, as, a, as a smooth uh, skin. And here you see it's a little bit dark, um, but this is the lady um, who donated a large part um, of her in ha final money because she died one day or two days before the opening um, uh, who uh, we showed how we were experimenting with these different ways and how the light would fall um, through. Um, and this triangular beam gave us basically three parameters to, to play with and by this time uh, 
our contractor, who was also our boss, um, uh, was very, very nervous because he was fully responsible for the budget, um, but he had no idea you know, what we were doing at this moment because we wanted to still continue to develop this design as we were, um, yeah, as, as we were getting close to, to construction. But we started to play with, this, with these different parameters of spacing, orientation, and openness uh, to create this variety of shadows underneath the, the canopy. Um, and in order to control the budget, um, we actually uh, developed this script um, where every single cell was modeled and through changing these parameters of spacing, of uh, orientation, and of uh, perforation, we could uh, at the same time control the amount of material and control the amount of uh, connections. And when we had the whole uh, model basically um, uh, uh, digital, it allowed us to, to, to basically say, well, we know exactly how much material we have, but we can distribute it in a certain way over, the, over this canopy so that certain areas be can become very dense where we need a lot of shadow or where there should be um, sculpture being shown or where certain activities can take place. And others that are above the building and maybe are not directly seen, they can be much less uh, dense. And we ended up with this, this uh, map um, and in a similar way to the skin uh, we did in Korea, we actually uh, decided to also be very much involved in the production of these in order to actually control um, that, that budget. And so we did some uh, testing. Again, we did a mock-up um, with uh, a similar, a um, uh, little bit more um, professional uh, group in, in, in China and worked again with the same engineer in, in developing you know, the structural performance of this. And while the building was going up, it's simple uh, corrugated precast uh, concrete, a steel roof, and um, uh, this, this steel main uh, structure um, that you see here. Um, we started to work on these 980 uh, custom uh, beams because other than the skin in Korea here, every beam um, was unique because of its orientation and also because they, they couldn't span the entire length. So this is the jointing of the different uh, beams that also needed to be uh, figured out and, uh, and designed. Um, because they, they, they touch the steel in different ways, all their connections needed to be um, unique. And so there was a lot of involvement actually in monitoring this and spending time between the, the, the people in China making this and, um, and the, the steel structure behind. Um, out of the 981, only one didn't um, fit. Um, and the installation uh, went much faster than, uh, than anticipated. And so this is a very interesting lesson for us because basically, because we took some sort of responsibility for the budget, um, we, we knew that um, in some way we also needed to um, take control of the information. Uh, and I think um, as architects, if you want to stay involved in, in making uh, um, something very bespoke or something where you're not just assembling uh, pre-existing systems, um, being able to control the information and, and through that being able to control uh, the budget is really essential if you, if you want to stay involved. Um, here you see the building. It opened in uh, November uh, last year. And you see how this canopy sits at the edge of the campus. It, it, it raises up to about 15 meters in the middle and then dips down to two and a half meters. In a way to reach out, um, the main campus sits sits here, it sort of, it sort of um, you know, reaches out a hand basically to, to people, to students to cross uh, over and come into this space. It doesn't, it doesn't want to appear grand and institutional, but actually much more casual and relaxed and, and open. Uh, and then you come under this uh, canopy and there the, the, the play of shadow and light is very strong. And as the sun turns, um, the, the, the different areas get activated and um, uh, uh, the, the, the light and shadow and the intensity um, changes. And then you move into the building. We made a very low threshold into this glass lobby that you see here. Um, and a courtyard. This is before landscaping and 
planting went in, but it's now very actively used actually as an outside uh, classroom. And then certain areas in the, in the um, uh, gallery spaces, they open up back to the landscape and there's places for rest so to look back uh, on, the, on the canopy in the space uh, behind. Um, with one sort of framing where you can see uh, the sky and as a sort of a negative sundial or a positive sundial if you want, you see this um, uh, half moon moving through the, through the plaza. Um, the last project I will show um, is a project we just did um, for MINI um, at the Salone, the design fair in Milan, and MINI is a car company, and I use this image um, to introduce the project because, um, as m you probably know, many car companies, uh, they don't know what to do because a younger generation doesn't want cars. Um, and so MINI is trying to figure out how they can uh, transform um, their um, business of making cars into something else. And they are looking at what, is the, what are the core um, values or what are the things, what are the, yeah, what is, what, what, what is it that a younger audience and a, and a younger um, uh, demographic want? And um, the idea of compactness, which is always the, uh, an idea of many, and sort of well-designed but small scale um, as something rather than big, large and expansive, is something that is uh, of interest to them. And so they've been working on this um, project that is basically called Mini Living, which is a research project for them into new ways of living compact um, in, the, in the city. And they asked us to make a concept uh, house to basically uh, experiment with how could one live with a lighter touch in the, in the city, maybe something that is mobile and can move around, um, and something that also speaks about a more a fluid and ephemeral uh, relationship with our environment and where the, 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 the climate also sort of has an effect on how this, um, how this uh, uh, habitation um, happens. And so it, it didn't have to be a, a functioning uh, house, but we tried to make it as, as real um, as possible. Um, but it, it needed to happen on a very, very compact uh, footprint. The total square meter of the house is 60 uh, square meter. Uh, for a three-family or three-bedroom uh, house with a master bedroom and a, um, a, a kitchen dining and a garden. Um, we made it out of uh, prefab, um, uh, or we prefabricated a series of steel um, um, systems, connections. So this is the steel framing, which are these elements that basically were fabricated uh, off-site. The, the site itself is in, a, in an industrial area in Milan in a little alley. Um, it was there for about two weeks and now it will move to a different place. But so the idea of prefabrication and the fact that it could be shipped and maybe used in different places and that you could have one of these houses and but, but in a way as a tent move around was one of the ideas uh, in there. And then we, 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 we clad this structure with this, um, uh, with this uh, permeable skin and in this case it was a film uh, that actually filters out the, the, the toxins in the air. They, they stick to the, to the edge and they get sort of washed off by the rain. So this idea that it is not, um, it's, it's not fully climatized, obviously, but it is something that still creates a more clean um, environment and filters out some of the, the dirty air um, behind. Um, and we also integrated the, the, the water systems. We captured all the rain on the roof that then actually um, uh, is captured and, and helps with the systems in the house itself. And obviously the skin also provides uh, shade. Um, um. And so the, the plan, um, I will take you through the different floors. There's an entry here. This is sort of a, a living dining space. There's a spiral stair that takes you all the way up. The second floor um, is like a study or lounge space with a first sort of sleeping pod, um, and then the second floor, there's sort of an in there's a, like a little stair to a second sleeping uh, pod um, here, so the two sort of almost tent-like uh, bedrooms. Um, then the master uh, uh, bedroom with a, with a sort of a, um, a bathroom facility here, and you see the uh, plumbing also going through, and then the top, which is this uh, uh, roof, uh, roof garden. Um, and now I will show it 
um, as we installed it, it was installed uh, very quickly within a couple of days. Um, you basically s stack the structure and then dress it, dress it up, so to say. Uh, and here you see it sitting in, um, in this alley. Um, and <coughs> during the day, it's very opaque and there's a lot of privacy, of course. Um, and let me take you on a house tour. Um, in the entry and this ground floor sort of living dining situation, you see the first uh, sleeping pod. Um, we use this trapeze uh, netting, so you, it's sort of like a hammock in a way, uh, which is on, the, it's this floor, it's the second floor here, and there's this little, little ladder to the second sleeping space. It's almost like a, a bunk bed, if you want. And then you take the stair up, and there's the, the, the master uh, bedroom, or this is still on the, the second floor, with one pod here and a pod above. Um, some of the f custom furniture we 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 made uh, for this as well, and all the floors are actually um, uh, from this uh, this grating that allowed the light to to filter through. Um, the big bedroom with washing facility. Uh, and here you see the the rainwater being collected and actually going through. Um, so there's an incredible openness also of systems and the seeing uh, uh, the, the, uh, the the understanding of this is actually something that is living and, and uh, an organism. Ah. Um, looking up to the roof, the the garden up there, um, which just peeks out over uh, the context and the, and the, the buildings. Um, and so at night, obviously, depending on how you light it, it becomes very open and very um, uh, transparent, and you see sort of the, um, uh, the, the life uh, taking place um, in, the, in the house. Um, so that's it. Um, we wanted to bring books here, but they're very, very, very heavy. Um, and so, if you, then Lars Müller said, if you use this code, you get 20% discount of the book if you buy it at Lars Müller's website, rather than on Amazon, because Amazon will take over the entirety of our society and will make us all robots. So it's better to buy it from, uh, from the publisher uh, directly. Uh, thank you. Оскільки у вас дуже багато, а часу дуже мало, в нас є час лише на одне питання. Відтак, нехай підніме руку той або та, хто впевнений, що це питання важливе. Які невпевнені люди зібралися? Питання, коментарі є. Я лечу до вас, а ви летіть до мене. Hold on a second. I need to get this translator going. Sorry, maybe a miss, but what was the cover of your last project? The cover? Uh, cover, cover, yeah. The material? Yeah, yeah. So this is a, uh, um, it's a, it's a, a PVC film, but it is coated with, a, with this coat that, that um, filters out the, the CO2 in the, in the air. So it is, um, it's a scientific uh, um, material that they're testing now, basically for filtration, also in air filters and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a coated PVC. Yeah, actually, there's two layers. There's an outer layer that's that, and the inner layer is a more stretchable fabric that creates more a sense of privacy. So the bedrooms they, they have this double skin. Yeah. Okay. Florian. Yeah. Uh, 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 thank you for your presentation. Your work is uh, very generous of you to share it with us. Um, one thing I, I like about your practice. Um, is, is how you kind of uh, are trying to deal, or I think, you can tell me if I'm wrong, <laughs> uh, it feels like you're trying to deal with this sense that architecture is usually static, and you're trying to get a sense of kinetic, and in literal ways you do that through the shadows and the project in Davis, and then especially with the pole dance project, but in others it's, it's a perception, or it looks like it's in motion, or it looks like it's more fluid. How do you, it's an abstract question, but I guess how do you dance, oh, forgive that phrase, how do you, how do you go between <laughs> Uh, this notion of the reality of something really being in motion and really being kinetic and this sense or appearance of, of uh, 
movement or fluidity? I, I like, that's a very nice question. I, um, it's, as I showed in the beginning, I think our first impulse was how to respond to, um, or how as architects who, who believe in some way that our built environment affects us, um, how to respond to you know, this super unstable uh, condition. Um, and so the, the first impulse was to play with this idea of, of the, the and, and find a new aesthetic, so to say, in this, in this unpredictable, in this unstable, and in this sort of um, uh, almost fragile environment. And maybe be also because of the economic reality of those times, there were very few permanent types of work, right? There's a lot of temporary uh, structures and many architects start with temporary things. And so obviously there you can make it very literal and you can make this, this, this kineticness a very literal thing. But I think actually, you know, uh, our belief and our, our, our hope is, and if you look at a structure like what we are in today, is that you can make buildings that last for a very, very long time and obviously then the kinetic becomes a different type of thing and there I think this idea of openness of the ability to transform and actually the maybe the people the user uh, and time itself are the things that are kinetic but this the, the structures are the ones that are more uh, permanent is, is something that we are you know exploring maybe more in that direction and so I think with form I will keep it short but the 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 the, the, the yeah, I think Dave's is a good example um, of trying to use the elements to activate it, but which is something that will be there for a longer time. Yeah, thanks. Дякуємо ще раз. Вас втричі більше ніж було з самого ранку. І так гучно, Флоріан Іденбург. Дякую.